Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So this is the next section of BIS 103. This is lecture three. And the focus here is glycolysis and sort of upfront note that there are a few sort of supplemental videos that are prepared for some important side topics here. One being on enzyme cofactors, another one on high energy compounds, and a third one on the importance of ATP all associated with what we will discuss in this sort of major part of the lecture on how glycolysis works and what it is. Just a brief recap, right, sort of to connect us to the previous lectures. In lecture two, we had discussed, again, sort of these opposing pathway concepts of anabolic and catabolic pathways, how they are connected through our common currency and the metabolites that represent these, which primarily is our ATP and NADH here. And we had a, started to talk about how it is important to understand the metabolic flux through these pathways, so the rate of conversion of metabolites in anabolic and catabolic pathways, and how we can use Gibbs-free energy to predict and calculate the pathway directionality um, of these reactions, so in which direction they may flux and whether these kind of reactions are thermodynamically possible. And then we had followed up on starting to talk about our carbohydrates. I talked about some of the major ones, some of the defining properties of what a carbohydrate actually is, some of the stereochemical properties, how we can um, handle the nomenclature for these. So this sort of is, is foundation for us today to start understanding how we can break down carbohydrates through glycolysis with a specific focus on glucose. So what I want to do today and what I hope you will get out of this video and our office hours that will be um, coming along side of this is that you should be able to describe the structure and the biochemical properties of ATP and its importance for energy transfer in all of metabolism and we'll see it today in glycolysis as an example. Again, there is a small supplemental video on this. Then next up, you should be able to describe the reaction steps of aerobic glycolysis. So this means you should be able to recognize these metabolites. This quarter, I will not ask you to draw any of them. You should know the enzymes and you should understand the general reactions. Most importantly, you should be able to explain the concept of substrate phosphorylation and what it is. Likewise, you should be able to understand and explain what high energy compounds are, how you can identify them on the basis of their defining functional groups. Here again, there is a supplemental video that explains this concept. And then last but not least, you should be able to describe the biochemical properties and the importance of cofactors. There again, there's a third supplemental video that sort of introduces us to some of the concepts and major cofactors that we'll be encountering throughout this quarter. So let's get started. What I want to talk today um, to you is about is glycolysis, really one of the major energy generating pathways across the kingdom of life. Um, in fact, glycolysis, at least variations of glycolysis, have been found so far in each and every organism that has been discovered. So it is one of the really unifying pathways, metabolic pathways that generate um, energy across all of the kingdom of life. So it's extremely foundational. So it's well worthy to start with glycolysis as a first pathway. Um, what it actually does is embedded in its name, glycolysis here, comes actually from the Greek, Glycus is sweet and lysis is splitting. So you can imagine what we want to do in the next little while is to actually split to cleave sugars to release energy. That's what glycolysis is actually all about. These are the gentlemen who did much of the work on identifying how glycolysis actually works. Those three guys and obviously their respective research teams Gustav Emden, Otto Meyerhoff, and Jacob Parnas. They didn't necessarily work together. They worked independently in different countries on various aspects of this. 
and the only one who actually ended up getting a Nobel Prize for his work on substrate phosphorylation was Otto Meyerhoff. This all happened sort of around um, the 1940s and earlier where a lot of this work had been developed using humans but also yeast as organisms to study this. This is it, so this is glycolysis. Just to give you sort of a bit of an orientation, note that we're talking about aerobic glycolysis here, so in the presence of oxygen. Next lecture, we will see what actually happens if we don't have oxygen at our disposal. The entire pathway is comprised of 10 steps, so they're numbered here throughout, one, two, three, all the way down here to 10. What we are bringing in is glucose here, Right. And we'll break down glucose periodically through this entire pathway all the way to reaction 10 here into pyruvate. And in the process of that, we can generate ATP. Okay. Again, what I, else I want to pay, pay attention to is the uh, properties of the errors, right? We had talked about this in the last lecture. There are some like these that only point in one direction. These are your irreversible reactions. There are three of those in glycolysis. All the other reactions here, we see double arrow, are reversible reactions. So they can flux depending on the conditions in different directions. Okay. What we want to do is to sort of walk now stepwise through this entire process and see how we can generate ATP from breaking down glucose. This is your first reaction. The first reaction actually is a phosphorylation of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, if you want to see some of the details on how this mechanism actually works, I provided some additional video on this um, together with the importance of ATP, where I speak a bit more to the mechanism. Here I will just keep it a bit more brief. So this is the first reaction, the phosphorylation of glucose. It's extremely important for a number of reasons listed here. For once, it actually reduces the concentration of the free glucose in the cell, which will allow us to maintain a favorable concentration gradient to continue bring glucose into the cell so it can be used for glycolysis. Okay. Another one is that phosphorylating glucose increases the polarity of the molecule, which will prevent it actually from passively moving across a membrane to the outside of the cell again, so it's trapped inside the cell, is now dedicated for its use in glycolysis, largely. And another important reason here is the activation of glucose. So adding this phosphoryl group actually provides a very good leaving group. We'll see why that's important. It actually provides a possibility for the catalytic enzymes to recognize the substrate, and it also provides a energy later to facilitate further reactions. What is crucially important to understand here is that the phosphoryl group for this phosphorylation comes from ATP. Again, right? see our additional video here for the details on how this works, but keep in mind this requires ATP to do it. Sounds counterintuitive at first, because I just told you, right? We want to make ATP in glycolysis. We're actually starting to use up ATP here but we'll see this actually makes sense. Because ATP is a donor of the phosphoryl group, the enzyme that is catalyzing this is called a kinase. It's a kinase that is using a hexose, glucose, as its substrate, so we call it a hexokinase. A kinase being a, an enzyme that phosphorylates its substrate using ATP as a donor of the phosphoryl group. And I would ask you to remember the name of this enzyme as a hexokinase. So this is our first step here again, right? We're moving from glucose here with our alcohol group at C6 right here to its phosphorylated derivative, glucose 6-phosphate here, phosphorylated at C6. And keep in mind, this is an irreversible reaction requiring ATP to facilitate it, to provide the phosphoryl group. Moving on, step two, now we have our glucose 6-phosphate here. Right, we just generated that. What we now want to do is an isomerization. Right? So 
the next type of reaction we had looked at in lecture two, the type of isomerizations. So rearrangements within the molecule. What do we do here, right? We have our glucose 6-phosphate, that's an aldose. We have an aldehyde group up here. And what we do is we isomerize it by moving the double bond, the CO double bond, from the C1 to the C2. We just sort of indicate this here with the pen, right? Up here, we have our aldehyde group. And right? if you actually want to draw it out, this is what it would look like, right? And here's your rest of the sugar. And now we're moving it over. Here's your C1, here's your C2, and then here's your C1 and your C2. Right? We're moving over, we're doing an isomerization, moving it to C2. Initially, this might not make a lot of sense on why we would do this. It doesn't release any energy. And we'll actually have to sort of hold our suspense just a little bit for the next reactions until we can actually see why this is a really important reaction. This being an intramolecular isomerization, it doesn't have a lot of um, free energy changes. So this reaction is actually fully physiologically reversible. What we're doing is we're moving from glucose 6-phosphate from the aldose to now fructose 6-phosphate the ketose derivative of it. This is what we call a keto-aldo interconversion, right? From an aldose to a ketose. So the enzyme here we call a ketal isomerase. It would be great if you would remember sort of this generic name. I don't ask you to remember the specific name for this reaction, but the type of reaction here is catalyzed by a ketal isomerase. Our third reaction now, Here's our product from reaction two, our fructose 6-phosphate. And this should look really familiar. It's really deja vu. It's another kinase reaction. This essentially is the same reaction mechanism as what we have seen for our hexokinase in the phosphorylation of glucose. Now what we want to do here is we are phosphorylating the hydroxy group at the C1 of fructose 6-phosphate we're moving to our product fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Bisphosphate meaning two phosphates, right? Now here at the C1. And now you already get some idea of why it was important to isomerize, right? Because otherwise we would not have been able to have this alcohol group here at the C1. It was an aldehyde group before in glucose 6-phosphate. The isomerization created this alcohol at C1. We can phosphorylate. That's part of the reason. I'll show you sort of part two of the reason why it's important in just a little bit. Okay. Much like our first reaction, we actually need yet another molecule of ATP as a donor of the phosphoryl group. It's a kinase reaction. And this is a really critical reaction again in glycolysis. The enzyme is called phosphofructokinase 1 or PFK1. This is one I really need to ask you to remember. We'll go back to it because it has key functions in regulating glycolysis, so it's really important. But right, we are sort of reutilizing, again, the same kind of kinase reaction as we did in reaction one. The next step now is different. This is sort of the first time we get exposed to another major type of reaction that we discussed in lecture two, the carbon-carbon cleavage. In this particular case, it's an aldo cleavage. The enzyme that is catalyzing it is the fructose bisphosphate aldolase. Right? What is happening here is that we're now basically breaking our fructose 1,6 bisphosphate into two halves. Right? So we're cleaving actually right at this point here. Right? What we're generating are now two molecules that are very similar to each other. One up here is our DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, another metabolite to remember. And the other one here is G3P, our glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. You should also remember this one. They're actually very similar to each other. If you actually compare them, you have your phosphoryl group here, right? You have an alcohol group here. And then the difference between the two is that it's a keto function in DHAP and an aldehyde function in 
G3P, so very similar to our difference between glucose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. Okay. How does this actually work? So this is a mechanism we need to look at in a little bit more detail. How do these aldol cleavages work? We'll see multiple of these throughout the quarter. So what is important here is now that you have these the carbonyl function here, right? And remember from our discussions on carbonyl functions, you have the oxygen actually drawing away electrons from the carbon, giving this carbon here a partially positive charge, which will result in the delocalization of electrons throughout this molecule. And this is really important for why we can cleave these usually very strong carbon-carbon bonds. In order to do this aldol cleavage, what we'll have to do is that we have an alpha carbon here. So the first carbon next to the functional group, the carbonyl group here is your alpha carbon. The next one up is your beta carbon. And you need to have this constellation here. And you actually have to have this hydroxy group here in position of the beta carbon to this functional group. What is happening in this molecule is because of this carbonyl functional group here is that the electrons will be delocalized from this OH group here, this bond that will jump to the carbon, will jump further here to supplement the partially positive charge of this carbon. The result of this is that you're weakening these bonds. And the result of that in turn is that you can actually deprotonate. So a proton will be leaving this molecule and that will further weaken this bond and you can cleave right here under um, the alpha carbon. Okay. The result is now one carbon anion here, right? So you have this carbon here that took on the electrons that jumped from this reaction and the rest of the molecule is down here. What is happening actually is that you have the proton that just left in this first part of the reaction is coming back in to supplement the electrons here at this carb anion, right? This will react as a nucleophile. Your proton is an electrophile, as we have discussed. You have then a reaction here, and so you will have the proton attached to the carb anion at this point. Okay. So the weakening of this bond through the delocalization of Electrons is really important to allow for this cleavage to occur. I don't expect you to remember this exact mechanism. What I ask you to remember is to understand where this cleavage can occur and what the properties of the molecule have to be. Right? So you have to have your carbonyl group here and you have to have a beta hydroxy group to this carbonyl group to facilitate this type of aldol cleavage. The result, again, right, we had talked about this before, just a minute ago. Your products are your dihydroacetone phosphate, DHAP, and your glycerol aldehyde 3 phosphate, G3P. Those two molecules are now the cleavage product of your fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Okay, so we have, we have done is basically leaving our hexose into two three-carbon products. And again, we have in one, the ketone function in DHAP, we have an aldehyde function in G3P, and much like what we could do before now for our next reaction, we can uh, summarize this. What we can do actually is we can use another ketone as summarize, now one that is specific to these compounds, and what we can do is we convert the ketone here into an aldehyde by uh, summarizing the double bond from C2 here to C1, and we can move this over. What we can generate in doing this isomerization from DHAP, we can generate two molecules of G3P. And so now I show you sort of this entire pathway here that we just went through, okay? And now it might make sense, again, so for the second reason of why this isomerization was so important, right, at this step two of this part of glycolysis, where we moved the carbonyl group from C1 to C2, 
A, right? It allowed the phosphorylation of C1 to have this alcohol group up here. And what it actually did is it created an almost symmetrical molecule. And once you cleave this molecule and you do the secondary isomerization, it allows you to actually generate two molecules of GC pre that are symmetrical. So without this isomerization, we would not have been able to use this cleavage reaction to generate two of the same kind of products, G3P. So in itself, this isomerization was not relevant to generate energy or release energy, but was really critical to facilitate the production of two molecules of G3P. And we'll see in the next phase of glycolysis why this is so important to have two molecules. Now, this first part here of glycolysis we call the preparative or priming phase. Priming because we actually haven't generated any ATP yet. We actually have used two molecules of ATP, one here, right, and one here in the third reaction. So the two phosphorylation reactions catalyzed by the kinases, but we have generated two molecules of G3P. And the next phase now, we'll see how we can actually use those to generate ATP. So this brings us to our next reaction, reaction six. Here we have our two GCP products from the priming phase. And what we want to do now is actually a combined reaction of an oxidation reduction and phosphorylation. This reaction is quite a bit more complicated. It's catalyzed by an NAD-dependent dehydrogenase. I explain the mechanism and the importance of this cofactor here, NAD, nicotinamide and anosine dinucleotide in a separate video. So watch out for that if you want to learn a bit more on how this actually works within the enzyme. It's a really important step on getting to our next product here, 1,3-BIS-PGA. So how does this work? What we do is a combination of oxidation reduction and phosphorylation. Importantly though is in this case, we are not using ATP as a donor of the phosphoryl group. In this case, phosphoryl group is actually coming from inorganic phosphate. So it's different. It's not a kinase reaction. It's catalyzed by a dehydrogenase. This is just to highlight a bit more of the principle of the reaction here. So we're coming in with our molecule of G3P. What we're doing is that we are oxidizing our G3P to an intermediary acid function here. So instead of this hydrogen here, we are attaching another hydroxy group. We're generating an acid. Remember, right, oxidations and reductions always have to occur in tandem. What is being reduced here in the process of this oxidation now is our oxidized form of NAD to NADH and H+. This is why it's so critical to have this cofactor. Without this cofactor, the reaction could not occur you must have a reduction that is accompanying this oxidation. Okay. Once we have this acid now, right, we have an hydroxyl group sitting right here. And much like we've done before, these hydroxyl groups now can be phosphorylated. And we see this happening here. Now we phosphorylate. What we end up with is this molecule here, our 1,3 with phosphoglycerol. And this is really important because what this is, is that it's a high energy compound. So again, pay attention to the use of our cofactor here. And we have this additional video that explains how NAD actually works in the context of this reaction. So what have we done, right? We produced from two molecules of G3P, two molecules of 1,3-BIS-PGA. And what we've generated is an acyl phosphate. So that's a high energy compound. And again, as highlighted here, there's another video that explains what high energy compounds actually are. Just in brief here, they are defined as compounds that release a high enough Gibbs free energy to facilitate biochemical work. In our case here in glycolysis, facilitate the production of other compounds through reactions that otherwise would be not fluxing um, spontaneously from left to right. Okay. 
And as a side note here, the numbers here, if you want to follow sort of the carbons all the way from glucose to the, through this cleavage um, reaction to our G3P molecules, I have listed here for your reference the original numbers of the carbons as they came from glucose. There are a number of practice um, quizzes and exams that I'll provide you throughout the quarter where you can work with these numbers to try and understand a bit better how these reactions actually work. All right, now we've sort of come into the really key phase of glycolysis. Right? We have oxidized um, and phosphorylated our G3P to 1,3-bis-PGA. And I said, this is an acyl phosphate. It's a high energy compound. And we can use this now in our payoff phase to generate ATP. And what's important to note, right, keep in mind everything we do now, we do twice because in our first phase, we generated two molecules of G3P. So all the reactions now in this payoff phase of glycolysis happen happening twice. So reaction seven, the next step. Here we have our product from our dehydrogenase reaction, right, our acyl phosphate. We can see sort of in the zoom in here, the functional group, right, we have a phosphoryl group that is esterified through this oxygen function here to an acyl, so a carbonyl group with another rest attached to it, that's an acyl phosphate, it's one of the key high energy compound. High energy meaning upon the hydrolysis of this compound, it releases energy that now can be used to facilitate other direct reactions. Okay. And what we want to do here now, the reaction is actually fluxing in this direction, we want to make ATP. And so this enzyme here, what it is, is taking our 1,3-bis PGA and it's taking ADP, so our adenosine dinucleate phosphate, so it's lacking one phosphoryl group to become ATP. And we're actually transferring one of these phosphoryl groups over to ADP. We're generating ATP. The result is now we have removed the phosphoryl group from our 1,3-bis-PGA, right? We have our acid function here now minus a phosphoryl group that now has been transferred over to ATP. We're generating one molecule of 3-PGA phosphoglycerol aldehyde. This mechanism of using a high energy compound and its hydrolysis and the transfer of a phosphoryl group from a high energy compound to ADP to generate ATP, we call substrate level phosphorylation. That's a term you really want to remember. This is a key mechanism of how we can make ATP in the process of glycolysis by means of generating high energy compounds. Okay. Keep in mind, ATP in itself is a high energy compound, but its energy release upon hydrolysis is actually lower than 1,3-bis-PGA. And so this allows us to make ATP in this reaction. So it's interesting as a side note, right, that ATP, even though it is our most common currency for um, bioenergy to realize biochemical reactions, it is not the highest one, right? But this makes sense because if this would be the highest one, how would you use these reactions to make ATP? So it makes sense to have a few compounds that are higher in the energy release and that can be used to facilitate the production of ATP. In a way, you can compare it to a banknote, right? If you only have $100 bills, it's really hard to buy anything because it's too big and you can't really generate anything. It's not common enough. But a $20 bill is much more common. So you can use it. You can break down your $100 bill, use all the $20 bills, and you know they're much more acceptable in stores and more frequently used. So it's a little bit far-fetched maybe, but I hope it might be just a simple example to explain why this difference in um, ATP not being the highest energy compound actually makes sense in, in metabolism. All right, so this is our first time, our first step in doing substrate level phosphorylation, right? What we've made is two molecules of ATP because we started out with two molecules of 1,3-bis-PGA. 
what do we do with our three PGA now? Right? It doesn't have the secondary phosphoryl group. It's actually not an acyl phosphate anymore. So it's not a high energy compound, or at least not as high in energy. And what we do is we utilize again isomerization to go around this problem, much like we have done in the priming phase. Right? And what we do is in this case that we are moving the phosphoryl group from the C3 position here back to the hydroxyl group right here. So if we're isomerizing the phosphoryl group from carbon three to carbon two, we generate two PGA. And this specific isomerase reaction is called a mutase, simply moving a functional group within this molecule here. Much like the other isomerization that we saw in the priming phase, this is a fully reversible reaction. There isn't really much change in the Gibbs free energy. Why does this make sense? What do we do with this? Similarly, as before, this isomerization allows us now to actually go back and to realize um, some of these re next reactions. I stepped one in the wrong direction, my apologies. So the next reaction here, right, we just had generated two PGA. So we had moved the phosphoryl group over here. And what is happening now is an enolase reaction. So we're actually removing water from this alcohol group here, and we're generating an alkene at this position here. And if you now combine this video with our video on high energy compounds, you will have seen that one of the types of high energy compounds are enol phosphates. What we have here right, is an alkene and an alkene combined with a hydroxy group. So here are the remnants of a hydroxy group. This would be an enol. And if you have a phosphoryl group attached to this, it's an enolic phosphate, and that's a high energy compound. So again, this isomerization in itself didn't provide us with energy, but it allowed us to generate this enol here, which otherwise would not have been possible. And just to highlight the energy release here, our 2PGA, it has a Gibbs free energy of minus 16 kilojoule per mole. Through the simple reaction of isomerization and dehydration, we are coming to a very important compound in glycolysis, PEP, of phosphoenol pyruvate, and that has a delta G0 prime of minus 62 kilojoule per mole. So a much higher energy release, and you can imagine what happens next we can make use of this. And that's our final step. And this is again deja vu. You have just seen these reactions right here from PEP. We are using substrate level phosphorylation again. We are transferring this phosphoryl group from PEP to ADP. We can generate ATP. What we're generating through the dephosphorylation of PEP is pyruvate. And again, this enzyme will use two of these substrates, or two PEPs will be dephosphorylated, two ATPs will be generated, and we're producing two molecules of pyruvate. The enzyme is called pyruvate kinase. But it, what it catalyzes here again is substrate level phosphorylation. And this is the end of glycolysis. So what have we done? What have we done in the first steps are steps one to five, right? our priming phase. We have used one molecule of glucose. We actually have used two of these ATPs in order to facilitate the phosphorylations and the cleavage reactions down the road. We have generated two molecules of G3P, and here we have two molecules of ADP right, from the hydrolysis of ATP in the priming phase. In the payoff phase, then, we have used our two molecules of G3P we brought in some inorganic phosphate and some NAD for our um, NAD dependent dehydrogenase reaction to 1 3 base PGA. And we're bringing in some of the ADP that actually was generated here and some additional ADP that you will have in your bloodstream, for example. And what we can do is we convert these into two molecules of pyruvate, our reduced equivalent of the cofactor NADH, and we have made for ATP. So as a net yield of what we've done is we have broken down one molecule of glucose 
right? We have used some of our ADP, some phosphate and some cofactor, but the key is we have broken down one molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate, and we have a net gain of two ATPs for aerobic glycolysis. So some key messages here is it costs ATP to make ATP. That's really important to keep in mind, right? Without ATP, we cannot actually use glycolysis to make more. Sort of easy to compare to gas in your car, right? If you completely drain the tank on the highway, you don't make it to the gas station, you cannot drive on, right? You cannot make it to the gas station. So you want to leave just a little bit in your tank so you can make it to the gas station and can refuel. Same kind of principle here. If you would entirely drain your system from ATP, you cannot make more ATP and that would be fatal. Right? Equally so, it's critically important for us that through the flux through glycolysis to continue, we must recycle NAD+. Plus, right? What you see here in our net reaction is we're generating NADH, but nowhere here is it indicated how we get our NAD plus back. It actually does not happen in glycolysis. It happens in different pathways that we'll encounter in future lectures. But keep in mind that equally to maintaining a minimum of ATP, we must have a way of recycling back our oxidized form of NAD, NAD+. Okay. And so in reality, we actually always have low concentration of this that are being recycled. It is very rapidly interconverted constantly. And what we're doing is we're actually replenishing this through a number of different ways that will cover at least a few of those um, in the next lectures. Right, so this concludes our lecture on glycolysis. I hope it gave you a good overview. Make sure you sort of learn the material in conjunction with the other videos that I provide for this session on glycolysis. Here just as a take home message, what you should be aware of and should no sort of going forward to the exams is you should be able for our quarter here not to draw but to recognize the structures and the names of all of the metabolites and the intermediates of glycolysis it really is the key pathway that we will go back to all quarter use the practice tests and we can use the office hours too to understand the fate of these carbons what is happening to the individual carbons in glucose all the way to the end products I really would encourage you to try and understand the logic of these conversions because it really will help you to not just have to memorize the structures of the intermediates, but to be able to essentially reconstruct what is happening here. You should be able to really understand and describe the significance of the phosphorylation through phosphate, and in doing so both with ATP as a phosphor donor, as well as inorganic phosphate, you should know the biochemical importance of NAD, right, as we discussed, as a cofactor for the oxidation reduction reactions. This will come in future lectures, especially next lecture, we'll talk about fermentation, but overall for the first midterm, you should be aware of the differences between aerobic glycolysis and anaerobic reactions, which especially is lactic acid and ethanolic fermentation. You should be able to describe the inputs and outputs. So what is our ATP yield? What is our products and substrates for the individual reactions? And again, do not memorize all of the enzyme names throughout this video. I've given you sort of some names that are highlighted, those you should know, but I will not ask you to remember the specific names of each of these enzymes that are functioning in glycolysis. So this concludes the session. On glycolysis, again, next lecture, we'll move on to fermentation and some um, other reactions that are important downstream of glycolysis.